Hey, hey, this is Tiger. Welcome to my stream. Hey, AJ, thank you for moderating my stream once more. We have a couple of times to do this until we get to the 100th anniversary of my... Not probably the anniversary, but the 100th time that we're doing this. The stream... Snyeshi! I have not seen this word before, but I am happy to see you, ZD Radar, on the, on the chat. I have learned a lot of Czech words in the meantime, but Snyeshi? I have not seen so far. Snow everywhere, yeah. I hope you're still doing quite well in Prague, not so... Uh, like the people in Munich, they are they, they really have a hard time at the moment. So we have some snow here, but not so much as in the south of Germany. And the dogs are enjoying it, obviously. It's the winter wonderland. Snieshi is snow then, probably. Well, today, what are we going today? We are resuming our journey into the arcana of Bremshundertstel and trying to resume the service that we could not go on last time, I think. I actually tried to make um, a safe game. What well, is not so easy because, in my experience, the same the sa the safe game and LZB does not really go well together. Well, Snieshi means that it is snowing. Snow would be Sni. I see. So Snieshi, it is snowing. <laughs> so it is a verb. So what I try to do here in the safe game actually is to. Um, turn everything off in the locomotive so that we can start with setting it up anew. The thing is, I don't want to turn on LZB. If you remember last time, <coughs> we tried to pass the signal in front of us. A quite weird signal, a red HP zero signal with We can still be in PZ Boom Mode O with a yellow 3. What would probably not happen like this brake selector? We are still in R because we are running light. What you would probably not get. Not that beep again. Spectre, hey, see you. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, not this beep again. I promise you we won't have this beep. At least not this beep. What we got last time, I tried to figure this out, was most probably because we went across the LZB halt. So LZB was giving us a zero in a distance of zero and we tried to pass this and We got stopped. And then in real life, not the PZB indicator and the G would light up, but this H indicator, indicator here, the red H indicator and the red S indicator, the Prüf indicator would light up. And then we would have to ask the dispatcher for um, yeah, clearance to proceed and then we would have to press the LZB override button for more than three um, seconds to uh, acknowledge that we got the order to proceed and then we can proceed. <coughs> Hope the Schnarre is <laughs> um, compliant today, yeah. I'm not risking it. I, I tried it once. It is actually possible when you hold down the um, LZB release key when trying to pass the LZB stop to pass it without getting into this weird situation that we went in last time. 
But then after that I got a tractor lock that could not be released anymore. <coughs> so did I do everything that was necessary? Well, we are here in, in, in this position where we got stopped by the AFB and I will just proceed a tiny little bit so that we can move on the objective in the scenario. Let's see if that works. So uh, that worked. We're still here at the HP Zero with two red lamps. So according to the rules from 1990 and before, this would even be an HP Double Zero, preventing not only Zugfahrten but also Rangierfahrten. And now the scenario wants us to contact the signaler. And what does the signaler do? he lights a uh, yellow three for us. Again, I don't think that this is a, a valid thing to do here. He should turn on the call on lights, the position light signals, the SH-1 here together with the red signal and one of the red lamps should come off so that we can enter this track. <coughs> oh, that reminds me. Today's big train crash in Cheska. Jebova, there was a train crash in the Czech Republic. I'm sorry to hear that. I have not heard this so far. I hope it wasn't too bad. I will try, since the dispatcher is not giving us any better, better signal, it tells us to proceed at restricted speed. Okay, the signal does not really say so. But since we are now in PZB and not, uh, <coughs> I have not turned on LZB, it should work with the Befehl 40, so I will try to hold down the Befehl 40. This lamp should come on. <coughs> we are restricted to 40 and uh, should be good to pass this signal here. Again, HP zero with ZS3 V3 I don't think it is a valid signal so does the Befehl 40 light come on? yes it comes on and we are past I can let go of the key the light comes off we are still in the well more or less starting procedure since we turned on the train here And this alternately flashing 1785 indicator tells us that we are limited to 40 at the moment, but because we are anyway not going faster because we are supposed to meet and couple up to a train. CD Raider says Vectron got it really bad, but only driver is injured. Well, I hope he's not too badly injured at any rate. What the train did not want us to do is to acknowledge the yellow 3 for some reason. So we feel 40 was enough. was not necessary to acknowledge the yellow 3. Probably we have to acknowledge this VR0 signal here. Yes. The yellow 1000 Hz lamp came on. So we are in a restricted 1000 Hz, still limited to 40. So far the damage is estimated at 150 million Czech crowns, which is about 6 million euros. Okay, that is about the price that they name for one Vectron. So do you know what was the, the reason for this crash? Red light. And and it was a freight train, I see. 
And do we know why the driver passed the red light? Who loads sand on ice? Oh! So the train was not able to stop in front of the red signal. <laughs> because adhesion was bad. To bad with all the sand. The sender was not enough. It happened this morning and you don't know the details. Well, I, I will definitely Google it afterwards. I'm always interested in the mechanics of accidents, especially railway accidents. So, for example, when you are crashing into the train that you're supposed to couple to because you're reading the chat. I think ahead of us there is already the train we are supposed to couple to. It is a full train with one another uh, Taurus just like the one that we are driving at the moment. Contact. Now this was... Well, not quite the contact. That's nice. Coupling is so easy. Should it not be lit in real life? I guess it should be when you are coupling up to this train so that you can actually see that, especially in a weather like this. It should not be sitting there dead. Most probably. But well, that's what it is. So what are they asking us to do? They want us to put the, tr the train brakes in full service because we will not be driving from this here. Set the signal lights to neutral because we will be using the other end. Obviously they want us to switch off the wipers. Set the reverser to off. We can also set the Okay, I sit down, then I will get this more easily. And then they want us to sit in the driver's seat on the other end. Well, maybe we also... Oh, we did not even turn on the light on our locomotive here. Well, so we were driving without any light as well. That was to make sure that the safe game works. But I should have turned it on anyway. The brake selector, I put it back to P. We will see what act, what, what setting we, we should use here anyway. P should be off on this end. Anything else that we need to turn off here so that it works on the other end? Well, we will have to come back to that for... Or maybe... The L B, we will probably turn it on, see if it works here. The C file we can leave on because we only have one switch for it that works on both ends then. So now we're sitting here. What does 
the game wants us to do. Exterior light. Headlights for this vehicle only because now we have a train behind us. Set wipers to two, we can do that. And now we already have to decide what PCB mode are we in. We already have a HP2 signal that allows us to start, but wait a second, wait a second. We have now a train. We look at it, it has different freight cars, habines, keels, S cars, more keels, and the second locomotive. So, how can we find out what piece of B mode we have to set here? And um, to what setting we have to set our brakes. This is where the calculator tool comes in. And I want to go through the process of using it outside of Dresden Nahverkehr, where ev everything is already preset, together with you, to see how I try to um, how to estimate what we need to do here. So this is my better version of the calculator sheet. You can see the works more or less, or the thing that typically happens with in the area that is not visible in the distributed version. And um, in this version, it is already possible to use two locomotives at the front end of the train. So I'm using two Tauruses now. And how we uh, how are we going to how will we set up this for the train? Well, we have to look at those numbers here that we can see on the pause screen. We have 34 vehicles, two locomotives, so. Uh, 34 vehicles all together. We have the gross weight of our whole train and the gross length, including the locomotives. And then we more or less have to count and check what cars there are. So we have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. This is the fourth one. Now it's already the fifth one. Five, seven, nine, ten. Ten of those cars. Keels. Then we have... Let's put punch it into the thing already. Into our calculator sheet. So I added the keels. They are not in the distributed version either. But now in the next one, they will, they will be there. They are empty at the moment. Since we have 1,750 tons, let's put them to loaded. Loaded game. And let's see where we end up with. And then we have S cars, SGM RS S cars. You know, they come in pairs. Here is the three, by the way, that was announced with the yellow one at the red signal, for whatever reason. So four, six, ten, twelve, fourteen. Did I count this correctly? Two, four, six, eight. No, it's only twelve. Sometimes. I find this not so easy to calculate and count the cars. No, they are 14 now. It's 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Am I stupid now? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Oh, my presentation is still on, I'm sorry. Well, that um, prevented you from seeing my efforts of counting the the cars. So let's put in 12 SGM RSS cars. Since they come in pairs, you typically get the numbers for the pair. This is why the sheet already halves it, uh, the, the amount. And let's put them to loaded. 
to check it out. The next thing what happens is we have Habin's cars. That is one, two, three, four, five Habin's and five keels again. So this will be our train setup. Habin's, five of them. Let's set them to loaded. I also turn on the sheet again. Loaded in the game and another five keels cars. If I put that to loaded, loaded game, and I can see that I end up with 34 vehicles, just like we have it. Oh, unfortunately, we cannot see it at the same time here. Maybe if I move it a bit to the side here, better. Then you can see 34, that matches. But we end up with a different number for the mass, only 1,708 instead of 1750 and I tried to find out what the difference was and I can spoil as much the SGMRS S cars are using a different load than they are using in the Dresden Nahverkehr. In the Dresden Nahverkehr they are loaded with about 40 tons and in the game here in Schnellfahrstrecke Kassel Würzburg they are loaded with more they are loaded with about 47 tons. So loaded custom allows you to put in a custom load here and then you end up with the uh, mass that the game is giving you here at the point. How did I find that out? It was actually a trial and error thing and decoupling when I want to try, uh, when I want to find out what a pair of the SG MRSS cars weighs, I coupled the train here, looked at the pause screen, actually st still in. So here I uncoupled the rest of the train of the consist. Then I noted down, took down this number here. Then it is 1,077.6 tons. Then I uncouple one pair of the SGM RSS cars, look again and take down the other number, calculate the difference. This would be the gross weight of a pair of SGM RSSs and then I know the net weight of the SGM RSS cars and if I don't know that, then I can look on the marking. It is 29.52 uh, tons what the empty car weighs. And so I can calculate the loaded or the gross weight of the car. And this ended up with 47 tons. And this is how you can use this calculator outside of Dresden Nahverkehr. And then back to the calculator. Where is the axle here? <clears throat> then we have our train here. On the top it says brakes on lead locomotive plus next five vehicles must be set to G because we have a long local formation. Why is that? Because our consist has a mass of more than 1,200 tons. And uh, according to the rules that were presented in my video about the train brake, uh, the freight train setup, we have to put it into long loco formation. We can run the rest in P because the consist weighs less than 1,600 tons. So between 1,200 and 1,600 tons, we have to go into long loco formation regardless of what cars we have and what mass the single cars have and so on. So this is where we can go to a long local. We have to put our two locomotives into G and then three of the keels. No, four of the keels because the leading plus five. So altogether six vehicles. This is 
why my sheet here puts four of the keels into G. And this we have to do in the game now. And what do we end up with here? We have 68 Bremshundertstel brake percentage when we were dividing the um, brake mass. What is that here? Brake mass for all the locomotives and the cars in the consist you can see just like what we talked about last time we have to subtract something for the g brakes 25 percent and for the p brakes we have to subtract five percent because of the length of the consist and then we divide our brake weight by the mass of the train and then we end up with the 68 brake percentage and the 68 is just above the margin we will see that later in the presentation between u and m and we can run this train in m if we have a descent here we would have to take into account that we are running downhill with a certain degree the sheet also already tells us that this train here is limited to 105 even on level ground because of its very low or quite low brake percentage that is almost u it's just like this just like this it's m so even on uh, level ground we would be slowed down to 105 as soon as we get like a decent of 0.6 percent we will be down to 100 so this is what this sheet does we will have a look at it what uh, what, what uh, algorithms it is using for now for our setup we know we have to put it to pzb mode m and um yeah set our brakes to a long loco formation get this out of the picture again here and then let's actually do it so on our lead locomotive we have to set the brakes to g We can't do it from this end because the selector is on the other end. Just make sure that the train won't run away. Yes, the brakes are still applied. So we have to set the brakes on the lead locomotive to G. That will be here. Brake selector to G. Then we have to get out into the snow. get on the trailing locomotive let's find the correct side it is always the side further away from the panel where you turn on the CIFA so we have to set this locomotive to G as well and then we have four cars that need to be set to G can use our flashlight pocket snickers hey I can hear the smile in your voice with how complex it is and the German train <laughs> yes you are right and you can hear my smile because it is fully documented in all the directives that you can download from the DB Nets AG site that was the first key that is the second one those levers are always arranged in a way that the more effective brake that allows going faster is pointing towards the front end of the train <coughs> and the slower brake setting is pointing toward the back end of the train and you can always recognize this brake setting lever not by its color there are some that are actually red but by this ball on the top of the lever whereas this thing here where you can turn off the brakes altogether is typically has like a, a loop on top of it so there is one more of those keels yes and I think I have said four of them it's one two 
three and four and the second locomotive so we have five vehicles in G and have set up our long loco formation by now Pocket Thinker says, I think I remember that from Dresden or a similar route, the correct lock direction. Yep, on Dresden we have been doing this along and Dresden was the first DLC that actually allowed setting this. I actually considered using the Hauptstrecke Rhein-Ruhr, but uh, the cars on this route, they have the levers in the model, but they are not working. So... Since Dresden it works. PZBM it's okay, the wipers are on. PZB needs to be turned on. Yeah, I will leave this door open in case that we need to turn off the, uh, the, the uh, LZB because it is doing weird things. One interesting thing that I want to point out is since we have two um, Tauruses coupled together, we no longer get um, the four driving motors and the traction offered but now we have lock one lock two loco one and loco two and we can see the uh, effort that each locomotive is putting in that is an interesting thing i have not noticed this before so do we have light we have light let's turn on yes 70 indicator this is the correct pzb mode afb on We got an HP2 that allows us to go 40, so I set it to 40, that corresponds, corresponds with the, or agrees with the starting program. We can release the brakes because the AFB will hold us in place anyway. Until we apply a certain amount of traction power and then we can try to get this train in motion maybe we have to use the sander a bit because the track will be slippery interestingly enough according to this we are only getting traction from one locomotive the brakes are not releasing completely either If I apply more and more and more and more, the AFB releases actually, and we are getting some movement, but still only one locomotive is pinching in. But now, some magic, some magic, I leave it the throttle at 25%, only locomotive 2 is pitching in. I don't do anything else but look at the external camera and back into the camera into the pit and into the cockpit into the cab and now we're getting traction from both locomotives. What is obviously a bit weird. But in case that you're getting traction only from one locomotive when you're working the 182 um, in multiple unit then try using the external cameras and coming back into the cab afterwards <laughs> hello Roskud and it's a new system by Siemens called DTG traction yes <laughs> well those are the things right I find it really cute that they have built their screen in a way that you can see the traction of each locomotive in the pair but obviously it is weird that only one of them is working unless you look at them from the outside and go back in again some somehow this uh, okay now Now the LS, uh, LS, uh, LZB turned on and at the same time initiated the end sequence.
and giving us stop in thousand meters. Now it switched to stop at zero, ten, still in the end. Train is trying to slow down. You can see it at the yellow color here. It's trying to brake and you can see it here. Now it is braking here with the G indicator. But not really stopping. Now we're getting to a new LZB area. Let's see what happens there. Well, now it is accelerating again, even though we are supposed to stop in like, what is it, 50 meters. This is why I left the door open, so that I can isolate the LZB here. I'm afraid LZB is not working, at least in this situation here properly let's see if i can get the train moving again at any rate i'm back into piece of b throttle zero rfb zero in case that because of the lzb end procedure train wants us to put the AFB to zero uh, at least now it is working again so safe game multiple units and LZB does not really work again only one of the two locomotives is applying power external and whoosh, the trade starts. Now we have both of them applying power. Maybe sanding a bit, because we are running up 0.8%. <laughs> so Spectre, what did you say? I'm not a software engineer, but it must be a nightmare creating this stuff, especially now when there are so many locals from so many generations of the game. Yes. I totally agree. It's so hard they can't do it. <laughs> I think it has gotten a bit too complex. It has, especially if you if you add the complexity that comes with like what what is it? Eight different platforms, PC, Steam, Epic, and so and so many consoles. Third party developers in it. Everybody appreciates that this is a complex thing. And still they tried to keep their old stuff up to date with the... Uh, uh, up to at least to the release of Train Sim World 3. Well, so let's, let's turn LZB off, what I just did, and drive this train under... PZBM. And yeah, we have seen it on the sheet before. We are limited to 105 even in on level ground. Maybe we have to have a, have to have a, a closer look on how fast we can go if there is any gradient, because we have seen we were going down or going up like 0.8%. And there are a bit steeper gradients still to come. Descents and ascents. Did anyone say third party? Don't get me started on the 187. Well, Spectre, to be fair, the 187 is a chapter of its own. That is, I think, the one locomotive and DLC that in my opinion is not fit for release. The other stuff with all the flaws and deficiencies you can very well use it and play with it and make the best out of it learn with all the things that work and don't work but the 187 is 
should never have been released. And they are very, very well aware of that themselves, uh, I'm quite sure. So, you have seen it on the on the dials in the cap. I applied a bit much power so that we got little wheel slips by taking it back a bit. This could be... Uh, uh, um, the locomotive was able to contain this. The radar says it has good potential. What loco is that? Hi, Eric. See you. Nice to see you on the chat. What loco is this that I'm driving? It is the Taurus the 182 in the Dispo Lock livery and with the Dispo Lock DLC outfit, and we're driving it in multiple units. And the potential of the 187, the Tech 3. I think everything has potential, but what annoyed me most, to be honest, with the 187, it was released weeks after Dresden was released, and Dresden introduced the the brake selector for the brake settings, and then the 187 comes out as the new freight locomotive, the flagship flagship freight locomotive and then it does not have a working brake selector. Your favorite route is Peninsula Corridor. Yeah, AJ's too. I don't know if she's still awake. But she's in love with the baby bullet locomotive. It's been a while that I have played this last. Now, for example, we're running downhill 0.5%, so 5 per mil. And since we got the train rolling after all, I think this is a good point to stop here and go to the presentation. And Pocket Snickers says, I have never used it, but it is so bad how it plays and they have never fixed it, but two games came out since. Yes. AJ, you're still awake. So your favorite route is still the Peninsula Corridor, right? With the baby bullet and the javelin. Those are the two trains that you do like most, I think. So, presentation time. Brems hundertstel, brake percentage. What do we need it for? I come back to what we have discussed last week. Last week we've started with this problem. The train has to stop in front of a red signal, but obviously the train cannot stop like a car in road traffic just on sight of the red signal, or it would be uh, it would be forced to drive very slowly, go very slowly, so that it can stop in front of the red signal. This is why in the German system and in other uh, signaling systems around the world, we typically get a distant signal warning us about the status of the incoming stop signal. Here, a yellow signal in the KS system. This is live presentation, right? It is live, yeah? At least on my OBS it is. And... Um, in the German system, we have a distance that is always the same between the distance signal and the, and, and, and the stop signal. At least there is it typically the same. This is the regular braking distance that holds through through the whole network. And on main railways, it is a thousand meters, one kilometer. Yes, it is live every week in the, in the stream so that I can make live mistakes and correct them in the um, comments after that. Well, yeah, this is where we started last week and we wanted to know how fast can we allow our train to go so that it will still be uh, possible to stop in front of the red signal after the train got the warning. And what did we do for that? We looked at the brake equipment, we looked at different brake settings, you remember, uh, for the air brakes, G and P and R, and then plus magnetic drag brake or plus uh, eddy current brake. And at the load 
especially on freight cars and the systems that can actually increase the brake performance according to the load with an automatic load change or with a manual load change. So these three things we factored in what we called the braked weight of a special vehicle. We have looked at the markings that are on the vehicles like on the Vectrons that give us for different brake settings different braked weights or for different loads different braked weights. So the rules for getting to the braked weight by looking at the brake equipment, the brake settings and the load that was discussed on last week's video. So if you want to rewatch that, you are very, uh, very invited to do that. From that, we looked at the train composition. We put the vehicles into a train, loco at the front, cars after that. And from this train composition, we deduced that sometimes we have to change the brake settings on our vehicle, just like we just did in uh, before starting our train here. We calculated the mass of the train and we found out that we have to set the first six vehicles into G because it is a long local formation that is required here according to the rules. So we had to change the brake weight of our vehicles at front. So there is something that works back to that. And then we have to look at the brake mode according to our timetable. If we go back, I did not say anything to this, but it was more or less clear by... Oh, it is not in front of the presentation, but it should be in front of the presentation. Excel here <coughs> in my sheet here at the top far plan timetable you can switch between PR and G and <coughs> if you switch it to G obviously then the whole train had needs to run in G see it switched back to G so then we would be much slower in PZBU because we will see that later in far plan G we always have to use PZBU so I assumed, since we are able to run our train not fully in G, but only with long loco, we are getting a P and R um, timetable so that we can make use of the faster brake setting. Back to the presentation. So the brake mode, we had to take this into account to make those discounts on the brakes that run in G. And according to the consist length here, train composition, we had to make certain discounts on the braked weight. So from the weight from the braked weight of each vehicle, we calculated the braked weight of the whole train. We added added up all the modified brake weights for our vehicles. And then we had that. And then we divided it by the train mass, the aggregated mass, gross mass of the whole train, including the locomotives. And then we ended up with our brake percentage the brems hundertstel this is how far we got last week and now we know uh, a number for our train like here on the train that we are running at the moment uh, 68 uh, but what is it good for knowing this figure how can we come from this brems hundertstel from the brake percentage to the speed that we can allow the train to go at this point here, especially in front of the red signal, so that we know that the brake equipment on the train, taking into consideration all the settings, all the load, um, the composition of the train and its mass, will still be able to stop in front of the red signal. Two things especially, PZB mode and um, speed restrictions that come from gradient. The first thing that we did after learning here that our train needs to be uh, run in a long local formation is to determine the PZB mode from two things here. I just said so. Brake mode according to timetable G on one end or P and R on the other end determines the PZB mode or predetermines it. Because if the brake mode according to the timetable is G, then the PZB mode will always be U. It is always the lowest, slowest PZB mode if we are running brakes on G, because G is always the least effective way of slowing down our train. This is why we have 
to use the most restricting PCB mode U throughout the whole train. If the brake mode according to the timetable on the other hand allows us to run the train in RP so that we can set our train into the long loco formation, then it depends on the Bremshundertstel that we calculated that way. Because if we have 65 Bremshundertstel or less, only then we have to run this train in U. If we have 66 to 110, we can run it in M, and if we have 111 or more, then we can run it in O. So typically passenger trains will always end up with more than 110 Bremshundertstel, so that they can be run in O, in the least restricting um, mode of PZB. Freight trains can fall in all three of those uh, of those categories. Often they fall into M, sometimes they fall into U, but sometimes they also fall into PZB mode O. Um, this depends especially on the brake equipment on the trains, especially on the uh, automatic load change. Cars with automatic load change that have a load that does not exceed the maximum of the capability of the system to um, compensate will always be a will, will most of the time be able to run the train in M just like our train here if we have on the other hand uh, cars like the tank cars the suckens that have a manual load change only they tend to be very heavy uh, compared to their braking capability so typically a, a loaded tank car train will of often fall into U and the locomotives they they are factored in, but they typically don't make a lot of difference because they are only one vehicle compared to like 30, 40 vehicles uh, after that. So it will only be factored in with a fraction. On the other hand, empty cars, empty freight cars can often come in a way that you uh, can use PZB mode O. One thing when we are talking about PZB mode, even if a freight train can run in PZB mode O, it will never be allowed to run faster than 120 km per hour because this is in the law. This is actually federal law in Germany that says a freight train cannot run faster than 120 km per hour unless it has a special permit by the uh, Federal Railroad Authority, the Eisenbahn Bundesamt, what we have discussed this last week already. Uh, there are some trains or there were some freight trains that were allowed to go faster, but this is more or less in the realm of experiments and trying what you can do there to make more use of the railway in terms of transport and faster transport of goods. So. With our Bremshundertstel, we can calculate the PZB mode. And why is the PZB mode uh, a thing that tells us how fast the train can go? Because the PZB mode determines to what top speed the train will be um, controlled by the PZB equipment. In PZBO, it will be controlled to 165. We know there is always this 5 kilometer. Uh, margin of error in it. In PZB mode O, the driver is allowed to not exceed 160 kilometers. The system will kick in at 165 kilometers, but still, according to the operating rules, the driver must stay at or below 160 in PZB mode O. On a freight train, it can't go up to 160. PZB would allow it, but the law does not. PZB mode M controls the train to 125. The driver is only allowed to go 120. And PZB mode U controls it to 105. The driver is not allowed to go more than 100. So this is ceiling speed control by PZB. All the time here before the train gets any warning, any caution signal to slow down to a stop. So at this point, on the left side on the, of this yellow signal, this is the maximum speed that the train is allowed to go according to PZB mode and the PZB mode depends on the Bremshundertstel so that the, the, the capability of the train to slow down determines what top speed it can go so that we can still stop it from its 
maximum velocity as soon as the train gets uh, a warning that it has to stop at the next signal. So this is the idea. And then obviously we have the different brake curves that are uh, uh, used to control the train. We all know that as soon as we pass the yellow signal, we hit our Wachsamkeitstaste, we get the 1000 Hz monitoring, and then the PCBO train has to slow down to 85 as far as it is controlled, but driver has to slow down to 80. In PZBM mode it is 65, uh, respectively 70, and 50, respectively 55. In PZB mode U and in the PZB 90 version we actually have a declining control, so we will always be controlled versus this brake curve. You got a bit more time for the lower PZB modes. I did not put this into the uh, drawing here because it is stuff that is interesting in our special videos about the PZB modes and so on, but not so here. Just here this should give you the idea that the brake percentage determines also how fast the train can go in this part of the approach to a red signal. And then we know that after we got the 500 Hz monitoring the train on PZB O will be controlled to a higher speed compared to the other ones. And in between, we know that the train will be always controlled to the 85, 70, 55, but has to slow according to its own discretion until it gets the 500 Hz influencing. Then it will be controlled by the system again um, up to the minimum within 153 meters and then it is up to the driver again to slow down the train to a stop. But you can see, according to the Bremshundertstel, we are getting more and more restricted brake curves here. So this is one thing, how the Bremshundertstel translate into top speed. And the other thing is the gradient. We have not factored or looked at the gradient so far, but it is obvious. If there is, if if the, if it is, uh, if if the track is going downhill from the yellow signal towards the red signal, obviously it will be harder to stop the train and slow it down. If it is running uphill, then it will be easier to stop the train. And so, if the track is going uphill towards the red signal, then we can allow the train to be faster at this point. And if it is going downhill, then we cannot allow the train to go that fast at this point. So there might be speed restrictions due to a gradient. And how do we get there again? One thing, again, we have to look at the brake mode according to the Fahrplan. And the other thing will be our Bremshundertstel, just like with PZB mode, but in a different way. How do we get from the Bremshundertstel and the brake mode to a certain speed that we cannot go faster according to the gradient. We use a thing that is called a brake table, a Bremstafel, and it looks like this. And this uh, looks quite intimidating. I have to give you that. I also have to caution you that this might be an outdated brake table here. Uh, it is the one that Open Minded posted on the Dovetail uh, Games forum. So I just took the liberty of copying this uh, picture here. And um, well, we will have a closer look at this, but this is more or less the instrument how you can um, calculate a speed restriction due to the gradient uh, in corresponding to the brake mode and your Bremshundertstel that you calculated for your train. So let's look at this a bit closer. What do we have here? It says Bremstafel, brake table, 4000 meter braking distance, main railways. So this is what we've talked about here. Typically it is a standardized uh, distance between the distance signal and the main signal on main railways, one kilometer, thousand meter. So the brake table typically tells you for what regulated for what standardized braking distance they apply or to what they apply. And this one applies to the uh, regular braking distance of one kilometer that we have on main railways. There are different ones for 700 meters, 400, 300 and so on. The next thing that we can, so this is the regular braking distance that is typically given in the header of the brake table. On the left here, we have our gradient. It is given in 
per mil, not in percent like the game is giving you. We can see it in, in the HUD in the game. It is typically 0 0.6 or 1.2 percent or whatever. Here it is per mil. So the colon is shifted to the right by one uh, uh, tick. So if the game tells you 1.2 percent, that would be 12 per mil. Gradient per mil. And it means that on one kilometer, the terrain is falling or rising by the number of meters given. So if we have one per mil, then it raises one meter on this thousand meter uh, track. So this is level ground. And then this is a very, very uh, slight gradient up to 30, what would be three point zero percent what we do not really have on main railways in germany we have this on the clinchfield railroad for example if you think back to the limited power uh, scenario for example yeah so this is the gradient and here we have the maximum velocity the maximum speed that we want to go on the track in the gradient and then the table tells us for every brake mode set out in the timetable what minimum brake percentage the train must have to be allowed to go this speed in this gradient. The minimum brake percentage. If the train has at least this number of brake percentage, it can go this speed in this gradient with this um, brake mode set out in the timetable. Still intimidating? A bit, I think. Let's have an example for that. Let's say we've got a timetable like we have it here in PR, set out in PR. Isn't limited power the hardest scenario that, ev that they ever put in the game? I think so, but it is also the greatest scenario that they ever put into the game. It is a bit sad that they uh, give you instructions when you're switching the caps that actually make the train run downhill when you're just walking from one end to the other in your locomotive. So you have to um, find a way around that on your own. But uh, apart from that, I really love this scenario. And um, on the charity stream that they had a couple of weeks ago, Matt was playing this scenario. And it is, it is always a great scenario to watch and play. It is, it is just lovely. Back to our, uh, back to our example here. Timetable says, <laughs> who had a runway train in limited power when, when he and she first started? Well, I don't know. I think every one of us got a runaway train scenario in, in limited power. At least I got one because the, the, the air brakes are just not enough to stop the train downhill. You need to know how to. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Because you need to know how to uh, set up the, uh, the dynamic brakes on, on the F7. Then you need to know that you have to wait a bit until you are uh, shifting the dynamic brake. It's a clinch field scenario. Yes, play it is. It is it is really great. And uh, well, don't don't trust the instructions when changing caps because the game will turn on the or they it will cut in the brake valve on the other end of your locomotive automatically with the brake lever set only to a uh, minimum reduction or something and then the train will run away and you did not do anything wrong because the the scripting changes that but for if i had that dlc oh yeah that is always on uh, on on um on sale you can pick that up for 80% off uh, quite often on Steam, at least. So tell us about when, when, when you first had played this scenario. 
But as soon as you figure out how to use the dynamic brake on the F7 and how to switch ends without your train running away while you are walking past your train to get to the other end and beat the scripting on, on, on this part of the scenario, then it's great. But back to my Bremshundertstel example here. Our timetable is set out in PR. So we have to use all the markings for P and R. So actually we have two tables here uh, aggregated in one. We have a table for R, uh, for, for R and P and we have a table for G. If we are only looking at P and R values, then we can just pretty much uh, merge out or just disregard all the lines that are connected with G. Did you see what I did? I just um, covered all the G markings with a white with white stuff so that we can only look at the R and P uh, numbers. If the timetable were set to G, obviously we would have to do it the other way around. And then let's say the piece of track that we want our train to run on has a maximum speed of 120 kilometers. Um, faster the train cannot go here. Um, so we would have to look at this column here, 120 should be the maximum authorized speed on this part of track. And then we look at the gradient in this piece of track and come up with a ruling gradient of 1.2%. We will look at how we figure out the ruling gradient for a piece of track on the next slide. But first this, let's say our piece of track does not only have a maximum authorized speed of 120, but a ruling gradient of 12 per mil or 1.2%. So we would love to look at this row here. So we have this column, this row, and where the row and column meet here, we get the number of our minimum brake percentage that the train needs to have to run the 120 kilometers per hour on this piece of track with a ruling gradient of 1.2%. So the minimum brake percentage is 112 kilometers per hour. So if we were to write a timetable for it, it would have in the header Mindestbremshundertstel minimum brake percentage for 120 kilometers per hour, 112. What happens if our train actually has less, like our train here with 68, or let's say our train has Bremshundertstel of 92 only. Still a rather high uh, rating in the M range, closer to the border to O than to the border to U, but not enough. We can see we don't have the 112 uh, uh, Bremshundertstel, we have only 92. What do we do now? We have to go slower than the 120, but how can we find out how slow is slow enough? We just go to the left here on this column and just check our actually our the bremshundes that we actually have against the numbers that are given here the first is 102 hmm, still not enough next is 93 hmm, close but still not enough and then 85 this one we can beat and then we go up to the speed and can see 105 for a maximum speed of 105 we fulfill the requirements in minimum brake percentage. So our specific train with the Bremshundertstel of 92 can go 105 on this track that has typically a speed limit of 120 maximum authorized speed, but our train will be slowed down. And this is what shows up in white on black numbers on the far plan. Like, if we go back to the Excel sheet, where is it now? Here. Open-minded made those far plans, those uh, far planet timetables for Dresden Riesa. Let's see if we can look at one of them. But here it does not work because our specific train... Yeah, here, let's see this. Typically here, this is already for our 68 Mindestbremshundertstel, the train that we are running at the moment. We are obviously not running from Riesa to Dresden, but we can look at it as an example. Those uh, speed limits that we would get here 
are applicable for all trains regarding um uh, not not regarding the the brems hundertstel but if we have uh limits that only apply to us because our brems hundertstel are lower than the minimum brake percentage that is typically required for this part of the track then we get numbers in white on black ground not black on white ground but black uh, white on black ground indicating that here we have to go slower because our brake percentage is lower than the typical requirement for this timetable this is why i also put this here in the presentation in white on black this is what the bremshundels do in a gradient to slow the train down so if you do not have enough bremshundels in your train to go the full 120 then you have to slow down and this is um, coming back to the axle thing again for our train that we are running here you can see that even on oh come on don't be so slow if we have a maximum descent of 6 per mil or 0.6% then we are already slowed down to, to 100 even on level ground on zero uh, descent we are slowed down to 105 because of our missing brake and with even more let's say we have a crass amount of 20 we would be slowed down to 85 and in the sheet i have put in the brake tables here i've separated the one for g and for p and r into do two different one that is the one for g and this is the one for pr and i turned it around starting with 30 going back to zero because it is easier for excel to get the values out of it and this is what the sheet does it compares the brems hundreds that are calculated here against the values given in the break tables and then it calculates those numbers the caveat that i have to give with this is that the break table that we are using here and that uh, open-minded provided is most probably outdated and not what they would use in real life nowadays but we do not have newer break tables and current break tables otherwise we would have used those obviously i actually wrote or emailed the eisenbahn bundesamt if they can tell me what the newest and current break tables are because i know that according to law they must approve them so the railway carriers have to send in their break tables to the eisenbahn bundesamt the railway authority so that they can approve them and so i thought maybe they need to be published somewhere and we don't really have a freedom of information act here in germany but uh, maybe they can tell me but they did not answer so i don't know uh, if anyone has current break tables that can actually be used here um, please let me know it would be very interesting to update everything here but the principle you can also use the old brake tables here if you don't have enough bremshundertstel on your train to fulfill the requirements given in the brake table then you just have to lower your expectations lower your maximum speed until you have enough in your train cd radar is lending a smiley <laughs> they don't care about individuals no they don't care about me at least they did not answer i even i even emailed to their burger service to their public relations uh, unit but nevertheless they did not answer okay that's that um ruling gradient how do we get to the ruling gradient that is a bit more difficult and a bit more um complicated because when you're running your train in the game the hut tells you values of 1 1.2 1 1.6 0.8 every couple of seconds actually and you don't really know for 
Is that the ruling gradient for this track? Do we have to use the maximum number that is given there? And I cannot really tell you how it is calculated for main railways, but for secondary railways in Germany, I have found um, a document stating how you calculate that. And CD Radar says, I wonder what would SJ un answer on this demand. I don't know. I can try and mail them. I don't think my check is good enough for that, but I can always try. Um, yeah, that's that. Maybe I should have mailed them in my official capacity, but um, I don't want to do this. Well, okay. Let's go back to how finding the ruling gradient. Um, this is the gradient profile for a fictitious piece of track. We have this piece of track starting at kilometer zero, going to 6.4, so it's 6.4 kilometers long. And this is the elevation above uh, sea level. So you have here, just like what you see on the pause screen of your game, this is the um, gradient profile. First it climbs a bit, then it falls, and it goes into some kind of a ditch. And then it climbs out again. Pocket Snicker says, man, it's nice that you could ask that. The most recent reason I have wondered about specs was when a train hit a snowplow that was sitting in 18 months. We'll know why. Yeah, that was in Chicago, right? The, the CTA commuter train hitting a, a snow fighter. Yes. What is interesting, because this uh, network is not subject to uh, federal regulations, and so they did not need to have PTC, positive train control. But everyone was uh, wondering whether they should not uh, uh, actually um, implement positive train control, even on, on those lines, yeah. And they are not connected to the to the national uh, network and I watched the uh, press conference that the NTSB uh, w was uh, giving was, gi was giving yes and they said that the system that they were using had some kind of a brake curve control the driver was doing the right thing yeah he was he was uh, driving according to the cap signaling more or less but the cap signaling system used a brake curve that was actually less restricting than the actual braking capability of the train. So the train actually needed more distance to slow down than the system thought. And this is uh, obviously why the train hit the snowplow or the snow fighter with 27 miles per hour. And uh, yeah, yeah, thousand yards more. I think this is what they said on, on, on the video. And if you have a difference of thousand yards, the snowplow was never supposed to be there. It's a hard situation, but still the system worked in so far as that it recognized that the snowplow was there, even though it probably wasn't supposed to be there. The system recognized it to be there and checked the, the train down, but not hard enough, obviously. Well, we will see what comes out of that. And uh, 18 months investigation, I guess, yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. I think that is what, what they take here as well. The horrible thing is that the most injured person was the driver who tried to stop. Yeah, yeah, th this is often the problem. Sometimes you hear the drivers, drivers are advised to flee from the cab in situations like this, and they see that they did everything what they, what they can, and the train will not make it just make a run and in those um, american computer trace and trains where you have the driver more or less sitting on the buffer is um, obviously putting them in in a dangerous place as well but back from chicago and um it was maybe 60 seconds from them going to full stop uh, probably Back to back to our ruling gradient to calculate actually the things so, so that that we will be able to stop our train. Well, it's the same situation here. We need to know how fast can the train go at a certain 
point to still be able to stop at the point where it needs to stop and um <laughs> Sorry to derail this too. No problem. This is why it is a live stream and the most interesting things come up with that. But um, uh, everybody who watches the video afterwards has to live with that or just skip, skip, skip forward. Let's switch back on the right track. Go back to our how to calculate our um, our ruling gradient. But the system, the, the, the problem is the same. Whether it is a, a snow plow uh, in Chicago or a red light in the German Alps. We have to know how fast can the train go to still make it in time to stop and when does the system need to intervene and stop the train and for that we need to know um, especially the ruling gradient because if we are running downhill towards the red signal we can't go that fast and uh, if we're running uphill we might be might be able to go faster so how do we get the ruling gradient for that and i was talking about the fact that i was not able to find the rules to determine the ruling gradient for um primary for main main railways but i was able to find the rules that m might probably be applicable for secondary railways um in this thing here richtlinie 430a what is also called the FNNE, what is the Fahrdienstvorschrift, the operating rules for the secondary uh, railways, for the Nebenbahnen. And in Appendix 22, we have an interesting um, description of how to calculate the ruling gradient. So this is our example track here. And the first thing that you need to do in this track, pick any two points that are two kilometers apart from each other and find the two points that have the highest difference in height between them and calculate the uh, difference, the uh, gradient between those points. So you find the highest gradient value between two points that are exactly two kilo kilometers apart from each other. And if you end up with a, um, with a value of more than 1% per uh, percent, 10 per mil, then you do the same again, but with a reduced distance of only one kilometer. So this is then the first estimate of your ruling gradient. And then you compare it with the actual gradient from the distance signal to the main signal. And we're talking always descents because obviously descents is the problematic thing Ascent is not so problematic because the ascent will stop the train. The descent will accelerate the train and we have to brake even harder. So let's look at this. This is my example track here and I have calculated all this stuff through here. This is the track distance 0 to 6.4. Like here 0 to 6.4. The bluish lines are always where my main signals are at point 8 at 2.8 at 4.2 at 5.4 and then at 6.4. Let's say this is where in my example track the main signals are. And this is the elevation, not elevation, elevation above sea level for those points. And then I have selected points always 200 meters apart. And this is this line here. This is my gradient profile in steps of 200 meters and then i have calculated the gradient for these steps in 200 meters and then you can see like in the game you end up with values that switch from 0 0.5 0 0.1 0 0.7 minus 0 0.1 this is when it is actually going downhill this is when it is going uphill and then you can see that you can get quite high values of 1.1 1.6 even for a decent and this is most probably what you would see on your HUD in the game. But then you don't have to look at 200 meters apart, apart, but two kilometers, respectively one kilometer apart from each other. And this is what I did in this column here, gradient per 2000 meters. Obviously the first gradient per 2000 meters can stop when I'm two kilometers in, because the first is zero to Two. And this is where I'm calculating here. And then you can see that it is actually evening it out a bit. Even though we have quite crass gradients for 200 meters here, up to 1.6 in the descent, the highest value for a descent that we can find when we look at the difference of 2000 meters is 
So that already points out that if we are getting in the game on the hard readings of 1.6, 1.4, this does not necessarily need to be the ruling gradient for this track. So for one on t uh, in step one, we end up with this yellow uh, and circle thingy here of minus 0.4, what would be four per mil, a gradient of four per mil. Um, we did not end up with more than 10, so we can skip part two. Well, we still have to uh, look at step three <coughs> and calculate the descent in front of every main signal. Again, the bluish ones are the main signals. And then we can see in front of this main signal here at 1.6, we have a gradient of 0 0.6 what is obviously more than 0.4. The other ones, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, here even plus 6, and even ground, <coughs> are less restricting. So we, went, we will end up with this purple uh, uh, thingy that I marked with a purple frame of 0.6. And then 6 will be our ruling gradient. And this is the line in our break table that we have to, would we, that we would have to use on this for this piece of track, according to the rules that are given in the Appendix 22 for the Fahrdienstvorschrift for the Nebenbahnen. And I guess for the main railway tracks, we have rules that might be actually similar. I don't know if we have to look at the difference of two kilometers, maybe it is more than, um, or if this is uh, modified in any way, but the idea will be the same. We will have to look at the steepest gradient in between and at the steepest gradient in front of the red signal. And we're looking at the descents because obviously the descent makes us harder to stop the train. Whereas the ascent will be taken into account, but only in so far as that we are checking if our train is able to stop at a maximum speed of 20 kilometers when going uphill, even though we are allowed to go faster uphill. Why would we do that? Because what we have in mind is the idea our train is running uphill. So it will have no problem in stopping in front of the red signal because the gradient will slow down the train anyway. The problem is when the train stops and starts rolling backwards again. Then it needs to be able to stop the train from prevent to, to prevent it from rolling backwards. But when it is starting to roll backwards, it will start with a velocity of zero and then one, two, three, and then the driver has to react obviously. So it is good enough to have the braking capability to stop the train uh, from a velocity of 20 kilometers. I guess this is the idea why we have for ascents only the requirement that the train needs to be able to stop out of a speed of 20 kilometers per hour. Yeah, this is what I wanted to talk about today. If we go back to our Excel and what this translates to in our situation here, with our tool here, we can calculate the brake settings so that we can set up the formation G or P or R correctly. Then we can set up our PZB mode according to the Bremshundens. Then if we want, we can find out what is the maximum descent on our route. Let's say we come up with a value of four, then we are limited to 100 with our train. Here we can also punch in the maximum ascent, but if we, let's say, have a maximum ascent of six, then we only need six Bremshundets, then this is obviously not a problem. So this rule for maximum ascent is only a problem if we have a very, very, very steep ascent in our, in our track, so that the train needs to be able to counter a backwards rolling train. And then what does the sheet do here? It compares, it checks what, uh, what is the maximum speed for our locomotive. The towers can go 230. The cars that we have in the contents are limited to 100 because of the load. That is another thing that can slow us down. And um, 
So the gradient is actually not the relevant thing that even if we are running in the level ground, we could go 105 according to the gradient here. This is the gradient again. Piece B, M would allow us to go 125 until it is intervening, but the cars are actually limiting us to 100. This is 40 EBO Eisenbahn uh, Bau und Betriebsordnung. This is the law that I cited that no freight train can run faster than 120. But where does this 100 for the cars come in? This is um, on the side of the cars. I can't probably not look at them when we are driving because we won't have the light for it. But I can maybe show it on the Excel sheet for the cars. Where is the sheet two? Here, this is the database more or less for all the cars that I'm using here. Let's see the STM RSS cars or the kilns that we have here. They typically have a Lastgrenz register that tell us how much load we can put into the cars so that they can still run with a certain speed. Maybe we can find it in the game as well. Worst thing that can happen is that we stole our train. So we're running here. Hit the CIFA. <clears throat> yeah, this is the last Grenzregister here. What this train can go. It is telling us that this spe specific car here can go S, what means 100. On track quality D up to a load of 27.5 it has two stars meaning <coughs> in certain situations it can go the 120 even if they are not empty whereas other cars have a different last grenz register But I, ah, this is where it is painted at and so on so you would have to always do the calculation and obviously the lowest speed applies It is not entirely clear what requirements need to be met so that you can use the 120 rating on cars with those stars, two or three stars uh, at the last Grenzregister. Most of the time it should be actually possible to run those trains and those cars with 120 if the braking capability is uh, secured throughout the trains by other means if you're running under LZB or even if you're uh, running under PZB and you have enough brake hundertstel or brems hundertstel to go that speed with your oh that was a a nice wheel slip that we go here might have seen how the how the speed clock went way beyond what we had Yeah, but this was more or less what I thought makes sense to talk about when we are talking about Bremshundertstel, how we can calculate them and how, um, yeah, and, and, and what what consequences come from a, a certain number of Bremshundertstel for your maximum speed on the train. Interesting that in this situation the safety system is not reacting to overspeed. Yeah, that's true. 
but maybe there is a system that can actually counter this. So let's see if we can get our train to a speed of 100 again. The weird thing for me, says Spectre, is the idea that the dispatcher gives you a timetable based on certain settings and that you might may be required to change them, like a sec second iteration to get the final brake modes. Yeah, this is how the different documents that you have work together on the one hand you will get the timetable and typically the timetable will have different different columns for different minimum break percentage we'll say like it will state something like this timetable is valid for a maximum authorized speed of 160 with minimum break percentage of like 180 for example or maximum authorized speed of 140 with minimum brake percentage of 150 for example and so on so it can have actually three or four different columns and then you can look at your train at your Wagenliste and your Bremszettel and see what the problem is and if you have even less than the Fahrplan is telling you then you have to ask the dispatcher for specific reductions. And the brake modes, the brake settings for your vehicles, they need to be established when the train is put together. And this is a thing where the driver and, and the personnel who are building the train obviously needs to agree, need to agree. And the final responsibility will be with the driver. He gets the document, he has to drive the train according to this. But as, as soon as the train is put together, then those numbers won't change anymore unless a brake has a defect and you have to, s to to switch off the brake on one vehicle for example and then there are even more rules for how many brakes can be disabled until the train can run no more and how this needs to be um, factored into the calculation You can always see when you're getting close to a wheel slip is when your the needle on your speed clock starts to jag about like this, see? Before we're getting a bad wheel slip, it starts wiggling like this. But then the wheel slip protection system can still prevent us from slipping. And then it is advisable to reduce the power a bit. Yeah, what I, what, what I was saying, the great thing the great thing on German trains is that you can read up most of the d directives because they are published because they are uh, Netzzugangskriterien so that everyone who wants to run their trains on the network of DB Netz AG needs to know what requirements to fulfill and so they need to be more or less public Whereas in the UK, you cannot really do those calculations because everything is done by the TOPS system. And uh, 
I doubt that there is still one living being in the world that understands fully the workings of the top system what is a computer program that was programmed in assembler in the 1960s to my knowledge and that is still used to do all not exactly the same but calculations that more or less serve the same purpose for freight trains in the United Kingdom and I've actually looked into the rules that that some American railway carriers have I think I looked into the rules of um, what was it BNSF and they are I don't know if they are even more complicated than the German ones but they are definitely in a way that you need to know a lot of details about the vehicles that you have in your train and about the load that is in the in the trains and they are very very much like micromanaging you have to calculate the braked axles on your train and a lot of other things so, so maybe I will actually find the time to dig deeper into that but every railroad carrier more or less has systems and provisions of that kind to calculate how fast a train can go on a specific piece of track according to its brake equipment, its mass, its load, its length, so that it is still safe to stop the train if necessary. especially in front of a red signal. And whether those rules actually come up with a result that enables you to stop the train in front of the red signal or in front of the, uh, of the danger is always a thing like with the proof of the pudding is in the eating you never know if it if the system works unless you actually get into the situation and then you will see if the train stops in front of the snow plow or not in the video about um, freight train brake setup the train in Dresden Nahverkehr it is not able to stop in the distance. Maybe because our brake table is outdated. Maybe because the simulation is not completely accurate. So where do we have to go, by the way? Oh, this is still a long drive to Fulda. still find it funny that the CFAR pedal is called Vigilance pedal here.
Here again, the brake marking for our disco lock. Different settings with e brake. and the weight of the locomotive Boeing just hit the pole yes and again guys just like a couple of streams ago if you have any ideas of topics signaling systems safety systems train tech elements that you think should be discussed in a video on a stream just let me know those two streams about Bremshundertstel was because Spectre asked for it I hope you did not regret asking for it because it is really not a simple thing altogether so if you have any ideas please let me know I'm very happy to come back to that Thank you very much, Spectre. I've not forgotten your um, thing about the electric trains, Eric, if you're still watching. And maybe I will... I, I have one or two ideas about electric traction that has not been covered in the videos so far. I've bought the Mountain Peak DLC in the latest sale, so I will probably have some steam videos again. I've seen that the Fowler 4F locomotive is using a different piston gear than the Stanier 8F. And maybe the Flying Scotsman has some interesting thingies. So maybe there will be more steam engine videos too. When we're driving downhill you can see how the AFB is actually biting to keep us below. This is why I typically put the AFB one click lower than where we want to end up. Doesn't really matter if we have 280 kilometers as a speed limit anyway. But from overshooting on the descent, sometimes can't hurt to put it to 95 if you want to stay below the 100. And again, only one of the locomotives is braking. External, and now both are braking. This is really a funny bug.
see the radar I think we, we talked about why the ICEs can go with a slower maximum speed at night on the Schnellfahrstrecke Kassel Würzburg I guess trains like us at the moment are the reason for this because we are occupying the track here with a speed of 100 maybe this is slowing everything else down I also bought the um, New York Trenton DLC finally and I thought we should get an update to the signaling system soon so maybe there is some more signaling stuff that we can talk about yeah that's the plan or those are the plans for the upcoming weeks next week I will not be able to stream but in two weeks time I will be back and this tunnel is definitely endless this going downhill to the middle of the earth and I have to admit when I was preparing for those streams and driving the services here with the Dispologs on the Schnellfahrstrecke Kassel Würzburg after work in the evening Sometimes the dogs woke me up again when I was falling asleep while running the trains. If you're suffering from insomnia, this is definitely a thing that you might want to try. It's so soothing. Will you get the Maintalbahn? I am hesitant because it looks a bit like the Nittertalbahn. To be honest, the Nittertalbahn was an extremely good DLC. And what you can read about the Maintalbahn is a bit mixed. I might not get it right away. Seems to be uh, seems to be a bit of a thing that the the debut DLCs from new um, third party developers are really great DLCs like the Blackpool branches recently and the Nidatalban for TSG. And then you think, yeah, that is a new standard for more DLCs and um, the later releases sometimes don't really live up to it. Yet the Talban is nice, extremely well made, but I would not want two similar routes. I understand that. But I have no idea if it is really similar. The the the, the zero train is definitely a different train from the six what was it again? Twenty eight, forty eight, forgot the number. That you run on the Nidertalbahn. So with the Main Talbahn six twenty eight, yes. Six forty eight is the Lint forty one, right? The Alstom Radia Lint 
every time you change something in the settings for the throttle going from braking to traction or vice versa one of the two locomotives cuts out what is interesting about the Niedertalbahn is that it takes a huge chunk of your hard disk I've looked at the installation sizes the other day and the Niedertalbahn is the second or third largest file much larger than Cajon Pass or even the Schnellfahrstrecke Kassel Würzburg here what is a bit surprising since it is quite a shortish route lots of trees here yeah. maybe that is actually a thing And there is a lot of stuff hidden in, in the forest and in the Niedertalbahn, right, from what I've seen on the forums. I've never ventured to look for it myself. It's interesting that it never clears up in this scenario here. And another tunnel, yay. So even though nobody asked for it, a drive-by out of the tunnel. Hopefully not missing any signals. Well, I think, guys, I will spare you the rest of the journey to Fulda and leave it at that. I hope you enjoyed my presentation about the Bremshundertstel in two videos, how to calculate them and how to use them to determine the maximum velocity of your train in gradients and according to the PZB mode and I hope you will be back in two weeks time next week I won't be on as I said and um, then it will be already 
one week or two weeks to Christmas. But nevertheless, I will be back in two weeks time on Sunday evening, just as usual with yeah it is not Christmas in two weeks time right it is the third today so the 10th I will not be there 17th I will be there and then it is actually Christmas so one more stream before Christmas and the 24th maybe I will I will do something around Christmas but probably not on the 24th because that will be a family event or maybe on the 25th maybe I will do some of the old Arosa line Christmas uh, Christmas special scenarios or so last year around Christmas we had this model train the F7 model and uh, maybe this time we will look into the Arosa Christmas DLC. I think I've never really looked into it. So maybe this is a thing to do. Guys, I hope you will have a nice time. Take care. While this train here runs unstoppably towards Hulda and the end of the scenario. Thank you, Tiger. See you next time. Guys, take care.